Welcome to Extension Connection on Super Talk 1270. Thoughtful information and discussion with experts from both Burley and Morton County Extension Service offices. Extension Connection provides advice on family nutrition, issues in agriculture, lawn and garden, community leadership, homeowner concerns, and so much more. Live from the Super Talk 1270 studio, this is Extension Connection. Welcome to the Extension Connection. My name is Ashley Stegman, and I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Agent in Burley County. And today, I am actually pre-recording the first half of this um, Extension Connection program. And then I will have Tom Kelb join us later live um, to answer some of those questions you might be having about your your garden and, and what to do now that we're the, the season is changing. We've got uh, weather that definitely is no longer summer-like, and so we some of us may be welcoming that, that uh, nice, cool change, and, and others might not be enjoying it so much. But the warm days and the cooler nights are definitely bringing the mind of uh, the seasons changing, and, and the dog days of summer are, are no longer here and and we actually are looking at a predicted frost that's a, a hard freeze we have had a few evenings where we've dipped below and and we've had a, a good cool spell but um, we haven't had a hard freeze yet that hard freeze is predicted to be the second week of October which is pretty pretty average for this area um, if you are a fan of farmers almanac the farmers Farmer's Almanac is actually saying um, this week is when we are supposed to see our hard freeze. And so uh, just for you individuals out there with gardens and flowers and plants, um, if you're wanting to further their beauty just a little bit longer, you're going to want to get those covered um, to, to try to save those. So as we're talking about gardening, um, I've got a program actually statewide. There's a North Dakota Master Gardener course that starts this this week, October 2nd. If you love gardening and sharing your knowledge with others, consider becoming a North Dakota Master Gardener volunteer in collaboration with North Dakota State University Extension. Um, this course is a, is a great opportunity for you to extend your knowledge about uh, many different topics, uh, topics that will include annual and per perennial flowers, tree selection, maintenance and maintenance of those trees, soil health, composting, plant disease and pests, and vegetable and fruit production. Um, I know I'm I'm really interested to learn more about tree selection and maintenance. Uh, lately, uh, our office this past summer had um, a, a increased number of calls and questions about trees. So learning about uh, the different types of trees, what trees are, are good for our North Dakota climate, and, and what trees that you want to put in your landscape and which ones are are better suited for a shelter belt those are type some of the the topics or that will be discussed within this master gardening course now this master gardening course will start uh, this Friday, so October 2nd that is. Um, it is a training program that will run 10 weeks. So it starts the 2nd of October and goes till the December 11th. Now um, these the, the course will be offered um, every Friday. The classroom training will be from 8.30 to 12.30 and there will be no class the week of Thanksgiving. This course will be offered online uh, in a traditional classroom setting. So we will be using a, so, uh, a technology called Blackboard Collaborative um, and the individuals that are presenting in Fargo in the classroom will actually be recorded and streamed um, to several different classroom um, locations throughout the state. Now the one closest to our Bismarck Mandan area will be out at the Burley County Extension Building um, and and we will be on on hand. I believe we have about 11 or 12 individuals signed up for that. Now, if you're listening and Bismarck isn't close to you, other locations are Cooperstown, Ellendale, Fargo, Grand Forks, Jamestown, Minot, Rugby, Steele, Watford City, and Williston. So if you are closer to one of those uh, towns, 
or cities, uh, please contact your um, local extension office in that county and they would be able to assist you with more information about that course. Um, once participants complete the training, so again, that training's 10 weeks long, uh, they will be known as a master gardener intern. They must, as an intern, must complete 48 hours of time during a two-year period um, on horticulture projects in their home and county. Um, after that, after the completion of the volunteer hours, they will earn the Master Gardener Certificate. Uh, so we have, in, in Burley County, we have a very large number of Master Gardeners in our county, and some of the, the volunteer hours that they do put forth um, would be helping uh, helping with our community garden plots, whether it is um, tilling some of that ground or staking the garden plots. Uh, during the Dakota um, the Dakota Garden Expo in April, they also are on hand to help um, distribute information, uh, seed packets, and trees. So if you remember getting a tree at Garden Expo, those individuals handing that out, those were our master gardeners in, in our community. Um, there's also individuals that help out at um, local parks around the area. There's a couple master gardeners that actually do a lot of gardening at the, at the the uh, Dakota Zoo in Bismarck and um, a lot of those that gardening is all done by local gardeners from from the community. Uh, projects include, if if you become a master gardener and you want to do a project, uh, projects include uh, answering questions at uh, either your county extension office, maybe being a, a judge for those 4-H um, horticulture exhibits, organizing horticulture workshops, um, or managing uh, some a, a horticulture uh, school or community garden. So those are some options that you have to um, partake in being a volunteer. Uh, for this course, there is a tuition. It, uh, for the 2015 class, uh, it would be $150. And um, those wishing to become a certified master gardener, in order to become a certified master gardener, you have to do the 48 hours, um, volunteer hours in a two-year period. Otherwise, if you just want to take the course um, just to increase your knowledge and no, no volunteer hours um, tied to it, there is a cost of $400. Um, computer knowledge and internet access is uh, and an email is also required. And so um, if you uh, do not have um, a computer, uh, you can definitely stop by our Burley County Extension Office and we can help you out. We do have some computers that you would be able to use um, at our facility. So if you have any questions about the Master Gardening course that will be starting October 2nd, uh, please give me a call. Uh, our, our, our number at our Extension Office is 221-6865 and ask for Ashley Stegman. So with that, um, there's just a lot of opportunities for those gardeners to get out there and to help individuals in the community. I get numerous calls throughout the growing season, um, individuals just moving into their home and, and not knowing what to do with that beautiful perennial garden that was there and, and they just don't have a green thumb. And so that's where some of our individuals, our master gardeners, really do come in handy and can help mentor and, and help those individuals through those types of questions. And with that, it looks like we will be taking a break here and we'll be right back with the Extension Connection.
welcome back to the Extension Connection. My name is Ashley Stegman. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Agent over in Burley County. And today, my segment will be pre-recorded, but uh, um, just in a little bit, Tom Kelb will actually be joining you live, and uh, he will be on on hand to answer any of those questions you have relating to your garden and, and horticulture needs. So talking a little bit more, just finished up talking about the Master Gardening course that will be offered um, October 2nd through December 11th on Fridays, 8.30 to 12.30. Um, The training classroom will be over at the Burley County Extension Office. So if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, let us know. Um, briefly talking about some of those pests that you may be seeing outdoors. I know um, one that has been a, a problem for the last couple weeks here are those aggressive wasps. Uh, populations soar until a hard frost kills them. If a nest is a ha- in, is in a hazardous place, identify and destroy it. Um, you want to make sure that you're applying a knockdown spray in the whole nest and then it's, it's very crucial that you're spraying them at night. Um, at night, when the temps are, are lower, these wasps actually get a little disorientated. So they are not, um, they're, they're not going to be able to really handle that spray and they're not as aggressive in the night times. Um, a cool night in the 50s is best. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're destroying that whole nest, that you remove that nest. And and after you sprayed it, go back the following night. If, if you still are seeing some wasp movement, you might want to spray again. And then you want to remove that nest. Because if you leave that nest there, um, then next year's crop, next year's wasps are going to come back to that to that nest. So removing that nest is going to be your best um, best option. Another one I've just been seeing, um, even at my place, box elder bugs. Uh, those bugs will congregate on, on your sunny walls to keep warm, especially when we're seeing the cooler temps now. Um, they're going to be trying to stay warm. Seal all crevices along your doors and windows um, and spray with a detergent, uh, a three teaspoon per gallon water um, to, ha- to try to... Um, to try to remove them. If they're getting indoors, you want to make sure that you're looking for any holes or crevices that they might be getting. Um, Continue spraying as bugs appear. Um, If you continue to see them, it's not going to hurt for for you to spray just a little bit more. Um, So those are a few pests that we might be seeing out and about and we have to uh, be concerned about. The other things um, I would going to be talking about is our lawn maintenance. This time of year, we really have to start thinking about how we're going to care for our lawn right before it goes into its dormant stage. Um, Now is the best time to aerate a lawn with a self-propelled unit with a vertical operating hollow tines. Two to four passes are best. Aeration is especially beneficial in compacted or thatchy soils. So if you notice um, that you have a lot of uh, small bumps in your lawn, um, if it's just not very flat and it's kind of kind of abrasive, uh, core aerating might be the, the ticket for you. If you do, um, if you find a small unit to be able to do it yourself is the best option. Um, otherwise, it does get fairly expensive. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at for lawn maintenance right now, uh, you, you're wanting, if you have any thistle or that perennial weeds, um, you want to spray it at this point in, in September to remove those weeds. Um, so you're moving the nutrients and, and along with that herbicide down to the root and 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 really um, kill that root off and and it helps prepare uh, prepare you for winter. So next spring you don't have as many perennial weeds coming back. Um, products with dicamba or trichofil are recommended. So those are the ones you want to use. That dicamba is very very important. All right, so we're looking at our gardens and we're wondering, are they going to make it any longer? Are they going to continue to produce? And I know I've got some tomatoes that are still on the vine and they're still kind of green and they look like they're slow ripening tomatoes. Um, You know, it's it's important you just be patient. Your 
optimal ripening temps are 68 to 77 degrees. So the more temps that stray from this range, the slower the ripening occurs. Um, uh, clipping the vines won't help this. It it just takes warm weather to get those tomatoes to really ripen. And uh, tomatoes with a blush may ripen indoors. So if you get your tomatoes um, starting to ripen, but you just don't know if we're going to have warm enough weather to really keep it going, uh, maybe picking them off the vine and bringing them indoors and, and exposing them to a warmer weather will help them ripen so uh we've been talking about you know these colder temps that that are inevitable they're going to be coming on us and uh just this morning i actually had a, a call from a, a producer and um he had a lot of Sudan grass, and and he is wondering that with these colder temps, if he has to be worried about his cattle grazing out on that. And um, just a reminder that Sudan grass, it, we're really concerned when you have um, have a, a snap and a freeze, and then you have warmth come back on. So you have growth that happens again after a freeze. Um, and, and that's where we have a height risk of, of some toxicity um, issues. So if you have a, a freeze and then you experience warm, hot weather, growing weather, and you're seeing about three to four inches increase in growth, um, that's where you really need to be concerned about that toxicity. And if if you uh, if you want the cattle out any more grazing on that. Um, but if you have mature stand and you're not and you don't have any regrowth, you will be fine. You just want to make sure that if you do have, um, you know, that freeze and, and any regrowth, you're going to want to evaluate that and 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 uh, maybe pull the cows off for for a little while. Um, I was just recently back home in Iowa, and uh, just to give an update, there are a lot of uh, soybean harvests going on down there, and uh, just driving across the state, we're seeing more soybeans being harvested up here also. Um, so um, Greg, uh, let's see, Greg Endress, he's a area specialist cropping systems from Carrington. He wrote uh, an article here about avoid harvesting to dry of soybean seed. Um, the standard seed moisture for soybeans is 13%. It appears common this season that soybean producers are harvesting soybeans considerably less than 13%. What difference does harvesting and selling soybeans at an 8% or 9% moisture mean to the bottom line? If you sell soybeans at 8% moisture, which you're looking, you you want to be closer to that 13% moisture. Um, when you when you're selling them at a lower moisture rate, you're losing um, on your yield, and um, in return, that's going to uh, lessen that price that you're going to be getting. You're going to lose, um, you know, an estimated per acre. And so uh, the example that there or what he suggests is so what can you do? Um, you know, when when harvesting a tough or a green stem, make combine adjustments, operate at a slower speed, um, begin harvesting at 14% or 15% moisture. Uh, you really want those beans, those soybeans to really be dry. Um, you know, eight per, eight to nine percent, that's pretty that's that's a lot of moisture yet. So you want to um, definitely wait and get more closer to that 13%. Harvest under optimum conditions. Moisture content can increase by several points with an overnight dew or it can decrease by several points during the day with a low, low humidity. Avoid harvest losses from shattering. Four to five beans on the ground square foot can add up one bushel an acre loss. If you are putting beans in the bin equipped for drying grain, start harvesting at 15, 15 to 14% moisture and aerate down to 13%. So there's a little information about your soybean harvest. And uh, with that, it looks like Jim's giving me the nod. So we are going to be taking a break.
Gary Free about his Sunmaster Sunflower header. Does a good job of uh, getting down flowers if you have any down. It does a good job of uh, getting all of the heads and you don't seem to lose too many kernels like with pans. To find out more about the Sunmaster Sunflower header, log on to CheyenneMFG.com or call 1-800-797-1883. Most models of the Sunmaster header are available for delivery. 1-800-797-1883. You walk through the door and say, wow, this is home. That's a feeling you'll have at the all-new Legacy Heights Apartments by IRET Properties. New stainless steel appliances, granite countertops, patios, and garage parking all included with each apartment. Pet friendly with options from studio up to three bedrooms. Located just west of Legacy High School, log on to IRETAPartments.com and experience the extraordinary. Legacy Heights Apartments, IRET Properties. This is home. For today, it'll be partly to mostly sunny, high as 74. We'll see wind gusts as high as 30 miles an hour. Tonight, it'll be mostly cloudy, a chance of rain showers, breezy with a low near 49. As into Thursday, mostly cloudy, we'll continue the chance of rain showers, temperatures right around at 68. For Thursday night, we'll continue the chance of rain showers with a low near 48. And Friday, another chance of rain showers, temperatures at 58 degrees. I'm meteorologist Megan Mulford on Super Talk 1270. Currently, it's 61. Listen to the podcast of many of your favorite shows now at supertalk1270.com. Good morning, everybody. This is Tom Kolb, Extension Horticulturist for North Dakota State University. And here we are on the Extension Connection. And we have, uh, we're going to talk a lot about gardening this morning. And we've got a half hour to cover about everything you should be doing in your garden right now. Um, Weather's getting cool, Jim, huh? You feel like it? So we're talking about getting ready for the really cold weather to come. You got it, man. We don't like to think about <laughs> that, but yeah, it is coming. It always does. Jack Frost. You know, mm. Jack has been a little bit tardy this year, I have to say. Oh, yeah. yeah it's just a couple, you know, usually I was checking the records and Bismarck Mandan, we usually get a light frost around uh, September 25th. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of us did get a light frost uh, like Monday. Very was, light, yeah. but right on schedule. <clears throat> pretty good, pretty yeah. good. And But now what we really worry about is those killing frost, killing frost. And yeah. That's, and that's like 28 degrees because, you know, when we just have a light frost, we can protect our plants in the garden. You know, just throw an extra blanket, cover our important crops, our sensitive crops, you know, like tomatoes and peppers and maybe some cucumbers. And then, like, for flowers, like maybe our geraniums and impatience, they're very sensitive. So we can throw a blanket and protect against a light frost, 32 degrees. But when it gets up 28 degrees, uh, a blanket's not going to get the job done. We really have to get out there and scramble and pick whatever yeah. we can. So, now, when does the killing frost usually come? You know, um, usually it's the average date in Bisberg Mandan is October 8th. Right. No, no, October 3rd. Let me get that right here. October We're only 3rd. only a few days away now. That's right. That's what I think, you know, and I don't see any frost in the forecast. And nothing close, you know, like we're talking about lows of 40. Yeah. And so, like, yeah, this is great. You know, because our growing season is so darn short here to begin with. And so if we can get an extra week or two, my goodness, we'll take it every time. Yeah. That really helps because a lot of our late ripening stuff, like we still got tomatoes on the vine that we're trying to ripen and, uh, you know, like uh, some squash and pumpkins. Often a few, oh, an extra week can really help ripen those out. Maybe we'll get an extra pepper or two in our garden too. So, yeah, let's... Jack Frost, just take it easy, man. <laughs> Sit back on the couch. Stay where you are. Have another drink. Relax. We don't need you for another week or so. Don't be nipping at our nose <laughs> too soon. Yes. Yeah, so like, again, October 3rd is our killing frost date. And, you know, when you talk about like putting on a blanket or something, think about like how we can protect our plants. And there's different ways that people do it. And just, I think just like pretend it's like, you out there in the garden, you know, what do you want to keep warm? If you were out there all night, just as a next year tomato vines, or let's say Linus out in the pumpkin patch, you know, yeah. for the great pumpkin, you know, what would you like to keep you warm? And that's why such like a blanket or burlap is really nice. And on the other hand, like like sometimes people use plastic, but plastic really doesn't warm you very much. No. I don't want to wrap myself up in plastic. So keep warm. And also in uh, layers, think about layers too, because, 
you know, I remember my mom always taught me, you know, put on layers to stay warm, you know, during the frigid temps of winter. And layers work for frost protection, too. So, What about, like, newspaper? Newspaper is a great insulator. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's better than plastic. Oh, yeah. It's better than plastic, and but it still can't beat a blanket. Yeah. You know, like, Jim, like, I don't go to bed with newspapers, you know, keep me <laughs> no. warm. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> Especially nowadays, there's not that many newspapers around mm-hmm. very much anymore. But... Um, you know, the other thing, Jim, is that, you know, as far as once we do get out there, once we do get that um, that killing frost warning, and again, there's it's not expected for a while, so we're okay. But as far as tomatoes, that's really the thing that people try to try to take advantage of is like and some extra extra harvest of tomatoes. Can we get those tomatoes to ripen indoors? And there's some tricks to that. And first of all, you know, you, you got to pick – well, you know, only some tomatoes will work with this. You know, you got to have a uh, got to have a good size, full size tomato, and then it really should have a blush on it, like a pure green tomato. It's going to really be hard to get that to ripen in. And the little dinky ones you're saying don't hold up very yeah, well. Yeah, they're not going to make it. You know, they're or they're not, they're not going to develop any flavor at all. So get a full size tomato that has some blush to it. Yeah. So. That's the key. It's got to have a blush. It's got to be starting the ripening process is already kicking in on it. And then when you, you scoop them all up, you take them in the kitchen or in the garage, wherever it's convenient for you. And then you got to make sure that you gently clean the tomato. And then you can only ripen indoor tomatoes, the ones that are clean of disease. And anything with diseases or spots or cracks, they're not likely to ripen indoor. So it's got to be blemish free. Okay, it's got to be a beautiful, you know, blushing tomato. And then what a tomato does to ripen, it gives off gas, ethylene gas. And so we want to trap that gas. So one of the easiest ways to make this happen is like you lay that sheet of newspaper in a box often or even on the ground, it's okay. And then set your tomatoes down on a single layer and then put a sheet of newspaper on top. And so that will help trap the ethylene. Now, if you're really gung-ho gardener, you can wrap every single tomato with, with newspaper, but that's a lot of newspaper, and most people aren't really that into it that much. But just uh, sandwich the tomatoes between layers of newspaper. Some people put apples um, or bananas nearby because they give off ethylene. And then what you've got to do is you give it room temperature, okay? You don't have to get – don't make it warmer um, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop the fullest flavor of our tomatoes, and the fullest flavors will develop under room temperatures. And that's also a point with, like, uh, like sometimes we put them on the windowsill, the tomatoes, but that's not recommended because what happens is you put them in a sunny area like that, it will ripen the outside of the fruit only, but it won't oh. ripen the inside. And so that's why, uh, you know, keep it out of sun direct sun keep it out of direct sun so don't put them on the windowsill that's not going to give you a full flavored mm-hmm. tomato and so those are some tips to to make it happen you know another thing going on jim is like a lot of people get peppers uh late this time of year peppers kind of take a long time to begin with and if we get these extra like we've got a we had a nice rush of warm weather recently and um so there's been a, a sex scandal developing in Bismarck, man, with peppers. Did you hear about that? No. Did you make the breaking news? You didn't catch that, huh? No? Uh, I think I slept through that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that was the, the late hour for the mature television there. But there's male, I heard a rumor that there's male and female peppers. Did you ever, that's what someone said. Like, And so the male peppers are the pointy ones. They have three <laughs> lobes. And the female peppers are... I had the four lobes. They're the blocky I ones. I did hear that story. Did yes. you hear that story? So yeah, you know, and the and the pointy ones, the males, they're spicier. So you gotta you gotta cut those up and fry those. You know they say. Okay. But the females are not quite so spicy, and so they're better for stuffing. So what do you think about that nonsense? Hmm. Absolutely ridiculous comments. Sorry, there's no <laughs> such thing as a male and female pepper. Because there's no, hey, man, there's no sex organs on those fruits. There's no male parts and female parts. Yeah. Man, it's just a pepper. No naughty bitch. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just like, if there's male and female peppers, like, do you have to have chaperones in the crisper drawer uh, yeah, to right. keep them apart? <laughs> or, like, what's the deal? So, no such thing. There are male and female flowers of yeah. peppers, right? But, come on, man. 
No such thing as male and female peppers. Just forget about that nonsense. So what else going on? You know, the other thing with the gardens that I'm feeling going on now is um, the the light frost. You know, are zucchinis at risk? You know, so some people are concerned about Some people call it a blessing, though, when the zucchini's finally <laughs> dead. They don't have to go out to harvest it anymore. It's kind of a blessing. Dig themselves out from <laughs> under all the zucchini. <laughs> that's right. So that, that, that problem will be over soon, you know, when, that, when we get a hard frost. But now winter squash, you know, that's a, I get that question a lot about, like, when's winter squash ripe? When do I pick it? And I think that really the easiest answer is just wait as long as you can before you pick it. So don't pick it until we get that hard frost, uh, 28 degrees. And But when, it, when we do get that warning of a hard frost, we got to get out there and pick whatever we can. And so, you know, when you pick it, be careful. Don't bruise it because winter squash, we want to keep in good shape so it can store through much of the winter. So, you know, keep a few inches of stem on it. That's helpful, too. Um, and then the other thing is that once you get them all in, then I test to see how mature it is. A mature winter squash, it will not be glossy. The skin, the rind will be actually dull. And also the, the rind will be hard. Okay, so like sometimes what we do is we kind of use our thumbnail or fingernail. And if we can puncture it, it's too soft. We shouldn't be able to puncture it if it's a mature um, fruit of a winter squash. And then what we want to do to keep it stored long term for most of the winter squash, we want to cure it. We want to get it that rind to harden even more. So you give it some warm temps, about 80 degrees, so like a warm place or me out in the driveway maybe is a good place, and set it there for about 10 days. So so it gets it gets warm, that rind gets extra hard, and then we can store it down in the basement or a cool place throughout the winter time. So that's that's what we do with our winter squash. And anything in the ground, like potatoes, you know, those vines are pretty much shot now. You can dig them up whenever you're ready to dig them up. Carrots, a lot of people wait until we get a light frost. Uh, it seems like the carrots are a little bit sweeter if we have for a light frost. So you can do that. Um, just wait till then. And use a spading fork when you dig instead of a shovel. If you can, you're, most, you're less likely to damage your potatoes mm. or damage carrots if you use a spading fork. So that's a... That's a tip for gardeners. And, you know, last thing here is that in general, this is a good time to clean up your garden, you know. And it's that, what that means is like after that hard frost comes, let's, if we have diseased vines, let's pick it up, get it out of the garden. Or if we have diseased material, you got to either get rid of it or dig it deeply into the garden because we don't want it that to persist on the soil. We want to get that out of there as much as possible so we can avoid the disease problems next year. And if you had a great garden and you want to expand it next year, I've got to tell you, this is the best week right now to expand your garden oh. for next year. Now it's time to get the plan because now is the time when the herbicides work best and Roundup or the chemicals glyphosate. So like, let's say you have an area of your lawn you want to expand your garden. If you spray that area now with, with glyphosate, and it will it will be readily absorbed by the turf, and the turf will send all that chemical down to the roots of the turf. You'll kill the roots down to its roots, and then what happens is that you have it after two weeks. It'll all be yellow, and then you can cultivate the soil, get it ready to rock and roll next spring. So now is right. a great time if you want to expand your garden to do that right now. This is the best time to put down herbicides, and we'll talk about more about that after we take this short break. Sound good? Works for me. Okay. Super Talk 1270 presents a comment from the competition. Greetings, conversationalists from all across the fruited plain. Coming up on my next program, you'll hear me talking about, well, you know what I'll be talking about, the same thing I talk about every day. Those liberals, those Democrats, that Obama. And what about that Hillary? Hmm. Had your fill of that guy? Give us a try. Accurate news, stimulating talk, Super Talk 1270 AM and Talk 1270com Men, if you're like me, you appreciate the feeling of a clean, smooth shave from a quality blade. The sort of shave that cuts clean, without the burn. So why are you messing around with generic razors that cost 32 bucks for an 8-pack? 
when you can shave with Harry's high-quality German-engineered blades for half the price. And if saving money and a clean shave isn't incentive enough, Harry's will give you their starter set, complete with a razor, three of their world-famous blades, and shaving cream for just 15 bucks. And shipping is always free. We'll also give you five bucks off your first order. Our way of saying thank you for trying us. How are we able to save you all this money and still give you the best shave you'll ever enjoy? By owning the factory that manufactures them. That's how. So go to harrys.com right now and enter code 6262 at checkout. That's harrys.com, code 6262. Need help? Turn to a local expert. A dozen eggs that were priced $2 on the shelf shouldn't cost you $10 at the checkout. Hi, I'm Shannon with Diversity Homes. All home building projects need to start with a realistic budget. Over just can't occur. But if you start with a realistic budget and your builder works with you to help maintain your contract price, it won't matter if you break a couple of eggs along the way. Diversity Homes, Bismarck Mandan's custom home builder. To learn more about your local experts, go to supertalk1270.com and click on the local expert link. North Dakota Farm Bureau. Our 27,000 member families believe in individual freedoms, limited government, economic advancement, and self-reliance. Come and stand with us. I'm Doug Wentz at eLending Now, your VA home loan expert. Call now, 355-4172. For today, it'll be partly to mostly sunny, high as 74. We'll see wind gusts as high as 30 miles an hour. Tonight, it'll be mostly cloudy, a chance of rain showers, breezy with a low near 49. As into Thursday, mostly cloudy will continue the chance of rain showers, temperatures right around at 68. For Thursday night, we'll continue the chance of rain showers with a low near 48. And Friday, another chance of rain showers, temperatures at 58 degrees. I'm meteorologist Megan Mulford on Super Talk 1270. Currently, it's 64. Bobcat Hockey Action with Paul Tiefel and the call on Super Talk 1270. Good morning, everybody. This is Tom Kolb, an extension horticulturist for North Dakota State University. And I'm here with Jim, and we're talking Hello. about gardening this morning. And, and turf. You got a turf? No surf, but the no turf. No surf. You got that right, man. No surf in North Dakota. No. no. No, it's not cool. even in Beach, North Dakota. <laughs> We've right. got a town named Beach, <laughs> yeah, no. and there's no no there's ocean no water there. within a thousand What's miles. Go figure. I don't know. I couldn't believe that when I when I read that. I thought for sure it's got to be a river at least. Yeah. But no, it was named after James Beach. Ah. I, I had a, I had to do a Wikipedia on that thing because I I just couldn't believe that when I gave a talk in Beach. Maybe they have beach nut trees. <laughs> I, I, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. If, um, it's a beautiful town, though. I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah. I really like that town and good people out there in, in uh, Golden Valley County. I think yeah. It is out there. And, uh, yeah, I give a talk out there about every year or so and enjoy that. But, no, we're going to talk about turf here. And the reason why, James, is we're going to talk because this is a fall's a good time to improve your turf. It really is because – this is fall is when the roots grow, and the key to a healthy, strong turf is a really vigorous root system. So we sh- so now it's the time, not spring. Most of us focus in spring because we got all our I got that uh, spring fever stuff going on. But actually, fall is the time, and there's a few things that we can do, and a few things we shouldn't do this time of year. First thing we talked about that earlier before we had the break about how it's a great time to kill uh, perennial, like perennial turf or perennial weeds like thistles and ground ivy, um, wormwood. There's lots of perennial clover if you want to kill clover. This is the best time. Actually, right now, this week, I got to say, is probably the best week of the year to kill them because what happens now is our perennials, these are the weeds that live for more than a few years. These are the long-lived weeds. And quack grass is another one. What happens at quack grass and our thistles, they, they're outside. They know the nights are getting longer and they're getting colder. They know winter's coming. Okay, They don't need a calendar. They know winter's coming. And so they're changing. They're not putting on so much top growth now. Instead, they're focusing everything down, down into their roots to prepare for winter. They want to survive winter. So they want to send their foods down into their crown and their roots. So the nice thing is that if we spray them now with the herbicide, what will happen is that uh, weeds themselves will take that chemical down into the roots, and that's you know that's the that's about the only way we can get thistle. My goodness, thistle has 
the mother thistle plant can have daughters that come that arise from underground like 20 feet away sometimes. So we got to get that chemical into the root system. And so that's why fall is, a, is the best time. But, you know, I just got to throw it out here that I had, over this year, I have to say the number one call that we get to our local extension office has to do with herbicides and herbicide damage. You know, got twisted tomato vines, twisted potato vines. What's wrong with my tree? The leaves are rolling. Um, their leaves are shriveling up. There's so much abuse of herbicides. A lot, there's too, actually, in many cases, too much herbicide being used in home lawns. And just got to throw out here that it's not natural to have a totally weed-free lawn. It's not natural. Also, it's not healthy to be spraying these toxic chemicals on our lawns on a regular basis, okay? But that doesn't mean... You know, they're, they're so evil. I mean, they're, they are useful chemicals. They're powerful and they're useful. But let's use them wisely. Let's use them sparingly, judiciously. Let's use them when they're most effective. And so the time they're most effective is right now. So let's say you got a patch of thistle out there or even you got some dandelions out there. Now it's the best time to control it. And then if you could... If, you know, if we can limit our sprays to once a year, doing it in the fall, doing it now, then that, that can serve as a good balance of giving us good herbicide, good weed control, but also minimizing our exposure to these toxic chemicals, okay? So it's a nice balance we got going on. If we just spray in the fall, maybe we can, we can do a spot spray in spring if needed. And that's the other thing. We don't have to be spraying the whole lawn. If you just got a few troublesome areas, let's just target those, those troublesome areas. You know, another nice thing about fall, besides it's most effective, another good thing is that you're less likely to cause harm to, to let's say, the neighbor's garden because the neighbor's garden is, is pooping out right now. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's not as active. And likewise, um, we're less likely to damage trees from drift if we do it in the fall. Because uh, actually the leaves are about dropping anyhow. And also we, we get less drift, generally speaking, when the temps are cooler. So pick a, if you've got a spray, pick a calm day this week and get out there and do the spray. You know, one time a year is, is a nice balance to go, I think. And I'll tell you something else I just learned this week is that there's some new, there's some, if you're, if you don't want to use any synthetic, the synthetic chemicals we use like dicamba, which is very powerful, 2,4-D, very useful. Um, they do, they are toxic. They're low in toxicity, but they're definitely toxic. If you want to go all natural in your lawn, there are all natural products. And uh, one that's just emerging now is iron, iron, iron chelates. And these are, these are products that university studies over the last couple of years have shown that iron will effectively control some uh, broadleaf weeds, including like Creeping Charlie ground ivy. It's very effective against that. So what we do is when we spray these iron chelates, it's a high formulation. You know, iron is actually good for all our plants, especially a lot of our turf needs some extra iron. But a broadleaf weed cannot tolerate iron a heavy dose of iron. And so what we can see is using these iron herbicides, these iron chelate herbicides, these super iron formulations, they will kill the weed, but they won't kill the turf. Actually, the turf will just look very deep green. And some of the, the most two common products you can find are EcoSense, EcoSense, that's E-C-O-S-E-N-S-E, EcoSense herbicide, and then also Fiesta. That's another one. And what happens is when you, when they, the plants are sprayed, let's say you spray a dandelion, it will turn black usually within 24 hours. So that, that really, it's just so deep, 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 deep green. It just it just turns black. And so that's a, that's a new tool we got. The problem is that a lot of these natural herbicides are more expensive. And sometimes you have to use multiple applications sometimes. So, but, but university research is showing that, let's say, three applications of an iron chelate herbicide will do an excellent job against dandelions and ground ivy and, and uh, control clover, all the major weeds. So that's, it's, it's a new option that we have for people who want to have a, 
a 100% natural garden. So look for that, these iron herbicides. And actually, there's a lot of momentum up north, Jim, up in Canada. Like Manitoba, there's there's legislation being introduced to make uh, the, the typical synthetic lawn herbicides illegal on home lawns yeah. and school grounds and hospital grounds to protect children from them. So there's a lot, there's a lot of movements there to reduce our use of synthetic chemicals. Again, our synthetic herbicides are very powerful very and very useful, but they are toxic. So let's use them judiciously. Yeah. So, but again, if you're going to spray weeds, now is the time to go after it. A few other things to throw out here. This is a turf roots grow now. If you got a thatchy turf or if you got a compacted ground, it's a great time to aerate your lawn. You can go to a rental place and get a core aerator, take two or four passes across the lawn, and that will open up, that will aerate the turf, and it will ex- allow those roots to grow even more. So every lawn, almost every lawn can benefit from aeration. You don't need it. To me, it's like a massage. It feels good. Yeah, I really <laughs> like it. And so your turf. It doesn't height. <laughs> it doesn't height. <laughs> but you don't need it. You don't, unless I like, get a, a place where people. You can live with. without it, but it's nice to have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure. So it all depends how serious you are about your turf. That's a good way to say it. Okay. I think seeding your lawn, it's, we, our deadline's like September 15th. So we just say hold off on seeding lawn this time of year. The seeds just won't get established before winter arrives. And so let's wait till November. We can do a dormant seeding that time. You stir up the ground, throw the grass seed, and the seed will germinate next spring. Okay, that's dormant seeding. But we're going to – don't seed anymore. It's, it's a little bit – it's very risky to do that. Um, other things that we can do as far as uh, trees, let's talk about trees. We can – uh, still plant trees, but you really got to get going on that as soon as possible. Evergreens, got to get that in the ground immediately. And also, please get a guarantee if you buy any tree this time of year. Make sure that you get a guarantee so that if the tree doesn't survive the winter, that you can go back to the nursery. And now it's a great time. There's a lot of great bargains on trees. Um, also, be very cautious about a large tree. A large tree will get more transplanting shock than a small tree. So these giant trees, you really got to be especially careful and don't recommend, actually, I really don't recommend planting the very large trees this time of year, and especially evergreens, because the needles are exposed, they're likely to, to dry out. Um, this is a good time to wrap your tree Okay, wrap your tree, prepare for winter. Put a tree guard on it, those white tree guards. That's a good way to go. To, and the wrapping will protect the, the trunk from getting yeah. sunburned. That's a, I always thought you wrap trees to keep it cool, but no, no, to keep it warm. But actually, you wrap a tree to keep it cool, to reflect that burning sun that, that when the, the, the sun beats on that bare trunk, it can burn the tree so and cause that crack on the southwest side. So wrap your tree to protect it from sunburn. So as you can see, this was a busy time right now. Take advantage of the beautiful weather and just enjoy the last few days and get out there in the landscape and enjoy it. Indeed. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tom. Okay, see you next time on the Extension Connection.